I'm going to bring a message this morning called Believing is Seeing. Believing is Seeing. You've heard it all your lives that seeing is believing. Well, this message has to do with the spiritual truth that believing is seeing. And we're going to learn some lessons from John chapter 9, which is one of my favorite passages of the Bible, because it has to do with Jesus relating with an individual and defending him over the group. Uh, Jesus is a hero to this man. And he gives him his sight, uh, and he also deals with the class conflict and the confusing ideologies that were present at the time. And we're not very long into the narrative before we see Jesus correcting people's misconceptions. So there's a great deal of lessons here. It's an involved outline, but I want you to follow with me in your word as we go through it just verse by verse. And we come to this, it says, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. Now, this man was apparently well-known. He was a man that everyone knew. Perhaps he was begging there. That's often the, the job that blind people had in those days. And so he was blind from his birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, their question was, uh, first of all, uh, based on a prejudice. There was a prejudice about his blindness. Now, they had this preconceived idea that was present at the time, and it kind of remains to this day uh, as well, that people who have uncommon maladies or uncommon sickness must have committed some uncommon sin. Now, it's interesting that they recognize and they admit, well, all of us sin, but the real big sinners, they, they must have these problems, or the ones that have these problems must have been real big sinners. And so here's a man that is blind, which is an uncommon affliction, so he must be guilty of some uncommon sin, either he or his parents. Well, of course, uh, neither of these is true. Jesus corrected them. But now let's just talk a little bit about prejudice in general. Prejudice is a great blinder. Prejudice obscures the truth. Lies are birthed through prejudice, and truth is hidden because of prejudice. People have been enslaved. They've been mistreated dehumanized and even killed because of prejudice. Prejudice is like scales on the eyes of the soul. It keeps you from seeing what you ought to see. It's a disease of darkness that hides the truth. It becomes its own truth. Other things that Jesus did, among other things, he corrected prejudices. Now that's one of the things I love about Jesus. When he came and if somebody said something that was just wrong, he'd correct them. In fact, he told the disciples, you believe uh, that uh, in heaven, he said, I tell you, uh, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Now, what Jesus is saying, if there's something you believe that's true, I would uh, let it stand. But if there's something you believe that isn't true, I would correct it for you. Jesus came to tell the truth, and he also came to correct untruth. And so there was a prejudice about his blindness. Okay, and notice what Jesus said. Jesus answered, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents. Now, he didn't mean that they were uh, people who had never sinned at all ever. What he meant is there was no sin that they committed that is directly tied to this blindness, of course. But that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Now, Jesus opened up the discussion to an even more mysterious concept. Okay, if it wasn't some sin that he committed, which is kind of silly, because if you're born blind, what sin could you commit in the womb? Uh, now, maybe he kicked his mother too hard, or maybe he had the hiccups too much. Uh, I don't know, but that's ridiculous to think that some innocent child not yet born could commit a sin that's so bad that, okay, the, there, there you go, you're going to have to be born blind. That's a ridiculous notion. And his parents sinning, why would that make the child be blind? Why not strike the parents blind? So this is the idea that they had. So the purpose of his blindness was the same purpose that everything exists in the world, and that is to bring glory of God. Now, this is a deep concept. It's too deep for us to grasp. And it's sometimes something we struggle with. Isn't that true? There are inequities in life. Some are tall, some are short, some are large, some are small, some have a high IQ, some not so much. Uh, some people have a lot of money, others don't. Uh, there are people who have worked hard all their life just to get by. In other words, who seem to skate and just good things come their way. There are all kinds of inequities in life, and we can't make sense of them all, can we? 
But one thing that Jesus said that I think is true for everything is that everything that exists, the good and the bad, the things we understand and the things we don't, is all there for the glory of God, either through His divine providence, these mysteries that will one day be fulfilled, and things that we do understand and things that we don't. So this blind, blind man's life was not one bit less valuable than anyone else's. He said that He has come. Okay, I'm a, He said but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Now this tells us something. Jesus knows all about you. He knows what is healthy and good about you. He knows what's unhealthy about you. He knows that your good tendencies, he knows your bad tendencies. And, and so you are important to God and your life counts for God. And this blind man that others looked at and, and thought he must be a lower class of person. He must be guilty. He must be cursed. Jesus said, no, the reason he's the way he is is so the glory of God could be manifested in him. And that is all the answer you or I need. Amen? When we go speculating about why things are the way they are, the best way we need to do is leave it up to God. And so then we come to the power over his blindness. The power over his blindness. We see this, that Jesus did a wonderful thing. Uh, he said in, in verse 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. <clears throat> the night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So he's explaining to them that this man isn't blind because of some sin that he or his mother committed. But you want to know the truth? This man exists and everything about him exists so the glory of God may be manifest in his life. And I'm here to do the work I can do while I'm here. <clears throat> and so this is what he did. When he had thus spoken, <laughs> he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. Now I just want us to hold on to this for a moment. This is a strange thing. Uh, Jesus spit on the ground, and from that spittle, he put his thumb in it, and he made some clay, got it all muddy and sticky and gooey where it would stick somewhere. This is Dr. Jesus now. Now I remember Dr. Granny, Dr. Granny when I was a kid. If I had anything on my face, it was a you know what I'm talking about? And, and in the old world, uh, spit was a universal cleanser. You know, you didn't have water everywhere, so you just do this. Well, that was kind of like it was in my family with my grandma sometimes. I didn't think anything about it. You know, I went to do this with one of my kids one time, you know. And my wife said, what are you doing? Well, that was back home, you know, not in our house. We're not going to do that. But this was that day. He made spit. He, he made clay out of the spit, and he smeared it on the guy's eyes. Now, here's what didn't happen. Jesus didn't give him a sermon. Jesus didn't tell him, if you believe enough, you can have your sight. Jesus didn't hit him on the head and a band play a big song and all of this. Uh, he didn't call spectators over to see everything. He just spit on the ground, made some clay, put it on the guy's eyes and said, go wash that off. Now, that's all that happened. And, and so this brings us to the perplexity over his healing. This is a strange thing that happened. This man was born blind, which means his eyes just didn't even work. They didn't work. He was blind as blind can be. Born blind. Been blind all his life. Uh, and so Jesus employed physical means uh, to uh, go along with the, the, the miracle that he did and put it on his eyes and say, go wash. Okay? Now, what do you do when God shows up? There is a perplexity over his healing. Okay, now what happened? It says, he went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. Now, here's what happens. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him that he was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? I mean, they recognized him. There he is. He's the beggar. And we've been giving him money all these years because we feel sorry for him because he's blind. Some said, This is he. Others said, He's like him. And he said, I am he. Now, the reason they said he's like him, because, well, he looks like him, but this guy can see, and the other one couldn't. He says, I'm he. So what do you do with that now? Therefore said they unto him, how were thine eyes opened? Now, this is all the theology this man has. 
He's telling them what happened. If somebody asks you what happened, you give an answer, right? This is what happened. He said, a man that is called Jesus. Now, now we know what that name means today, but you know, in that day, there were many men named Jesus. They were all over the place. Uh, perhaps every, every 10th or every 12th man name could be Jesus. There were Jesuses all over the place. All he knows is this man named Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received sight. Well, you get an A in theology. Actually, this was not theology at all. This was just an accounting of what happened. A man named Jesus, what, virtually a stranger to him. I don't think he knew it was Jesus of Nazareth, the healer. I don't know if he knew that he was any special person of any import at all. We don't know this. But he, he told them exactly what happened. And it's a perplexity. They're having a hard time digesting this. Okay? And, and then they said unto him, where is he? He said, I know not. I don't know where he is. He was there, and now I'm here, and he's somewhere else. I don't, I don't know. Oh, well, what do you do when God shows up? Well, you scratch your head and have to do some thinking now, don't you? Here's a blind man, and now he can see. A man named Jesus somehow gave him his sight. They brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. Now they want to know what happened. So let's look at the Pharisaical rejection. So I've got an outline on this. The Pharisaical rejection. They bring him to the Pharisees. Now who are the Pharisees? Where they were the, the religious leaders. They, they were the, the people who were supposed to know things about God. They were the people who were supposed to be experts on the Scripture. They were the people who, if there's a mystery, you go ask them. If there's something supernatural, they're supposed to be the experts on the supernatural. After all, uh, they're better than everybody else. They know God better than anyone else knows Him. And so they brought Him to the Pharisees. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. And I think Jesus did that on the Sabbath day on purpose, just to rattle the Pharisees. Then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said unto them, he that put clay upon mine eyes, uh, he put clay upon mine eyes and I washed and do see. So he gives them a, a shorter version of it. Put clay on my eyes, washed see. <laughs> that didn't do it for them. They want more. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Now what are they thinking? These experts are saying he, this couldn't be a real miracle. This couldn't be a man of God because he worked on the Sabbath. Well, wait a minute. There's nothing in the Bible that says you can't cure a man of blindness on the Sabbath day. There's nothing in the Bible that says you can't make clay, that you can't spit on the ground, that you can't make clay, that you can't put it on somebody's eyes. There's nothing in the Bible that says you can't wash your eyes. There's nothing in the Bible against all of that. But they had made up their own man-made rules, and according to their own man-made rules, Jesus couldn't be of God because he didn't follow our own man-made rules. That's basically the pharisaical mentality right there. Okay, so they said, this man is not of God because he keepeth not the Sabbath. Others, others who had better sense... How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. Some of the Pharisees were more open-minded, and they said, listen, this is a real miracle. This is something only God can do. We ought not be quick to judge. All right? They say unto the blind man, what sayest thou of him that hath opened thine eyes? Now, they're wanting to get his opinion, see. Now, notice, uh, this is so sad. Uh, they're divided over Jesus' authenticity, they doubted the miracle was real. Here's what they're doing. They're doubting it's real. They want to find out. What do you say of him that hath opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. Now, what he's thinking, you know, prophets were people who could do miracles. Prophets were people who knew God in a special way. Prophets were people through whom God channeled supernatural power to do things a normal, ordinary man could not. Now, this man has a brain that works properly. He's been blind all his life. Nobody else gave him his sight. The Pharisees never gave him his sight. The priests never gave him his sight. Nobody else ever gave him his sight. I don't know that anybody ever even tried. But here is a man who did something that gave him his sight, and they asked him, what do you think about him? He's a prophet. He's somebody through whom God works. 
That was his answer. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind. They received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. So here, uh, they discussed the matter with his parents. You say, they want to, well, is this a really miracle or not? Because they're, they're befuddled. They don't know what to do. They're perplexed. They're, they're working on the theory. Ah, something's up with this. This is some conniving that's been going on. And some of them are probably thinking, this fellow never was blind in the first place. He's been sitting here all this time with his little tin cup and is, is tapping on it and begging for money and pretending to be blind. And all these years we've been giving him money and he's not even blind. That's what some of them are thinking. So what do they do? They, they call the parents. And, and, and it says, um, they ask him saying, is this your son whom ye say was born blind? How then doth he see? Now what they're implying here, you made out all these years like this fella is blind, but look, he sees. Now they're trying to put the blame on the parents and, and they're demanding that they uh, give an answer. And so they're discussing the matter with the parents here. And, and notice what happens. It says, uh, you say that he was born blind. Okay, so his parents answered them and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. So those are the facts here. This is our son. He was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Now they're being as honest as they can possibly be. They, they answered the things they knew about and the things they didn't know about, they admitted that they didn't know about. Them. Wouldn't it be great if most people were that way? If they knew the things they knew about and, and admitted they didn't know about the things they didn't know about. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. You know, this, this child of ours, he's not eight years old. He's not a, a, a minor. He's a grown man, able to stand on his own two feet and give an answer. We know that we gave him uh, birth. We know that he was blind from birth. We know this is him, but we don't know how he's seeing. Ask him. Ask him. He'll speak for himself. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had, had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was the Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Ah, his parents are figuring this out. This must be that Jesus. This must be the Jesus we've heard about. This must be the Jesus that can do miracles. And so they're on a fishing expedition and they're getting us involved. We don't want to be involved with that. Now these, these parents, they're just Jews. They're Jews following the Jewish system. They've been going to synagogue. They've been listening to the messages. They've been going through the rituals. They've been doing all the things they're supposed to do. They've heard about Jesus. They know that he's a miracle worker. And so they don't want to get involved. They don't want to be accused of following him and saying he's the Christ. Why? Because if anybody confessed, they were going to be kicked out of the church, kicked out of the synagogue. Therefore said his parents, he is of age, ask him. Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God praise. We know that this man is a sinner. Now this is an interesting thing. Here they demand a recount of the story. They say, Give God praise. This man is a sinner. So what they're trying to do is separate the miracle from the man that performed it. To separate the miraculous act from the one who instigated it. They're trying to remove it from him. Okay? He answered and said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. Now, he's, he's admitting what he doesn't know. He knows his name is Jesus. He knows he put clay on his eyes and told him to go wash. He went and washed and he could see. He said, I don't know about him. I don't know if he's a sinner or not. All right. So he's not, he's not really up on his theology yet. I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. He knows that. Listen, that's, that's pretty good theology right there. There's a lot I don't know, but I know this. I was blind, but now I see. You ever think about the thief on the cross? He got up to heaven. And what if they quizzed him like people do down here? What, what's your theory on justification? I don't know. What, what do you, how, do you, how would you define the word atonement? I don't know. I mean, they could ask him any number of questions on theology, and he'd just have to shrug his shoulder and say, I don't know. 
he ever been baptized? He said, no. You ever joined a church? No. You ever been to a Bible study? No. You ever been on visitation? No. You ever come out for work day and rake leaves? No. Why do you think you should be in here? What would his answer be? And he would say, the man on the middle cross said I could come. That was all the theology he had. That's all he needed. And Alistair Begg, one of the greatest uh, preachers that I've ever heard on that, made a point of that in a great way. And I'm borrowing it from him because that's so the truth. Listen, your theology should be based on your relationship with God. And then the word of God builds upon that as you go, because that's the foundation Your relationship with God is that you're born again. Now, this man was given physical sight. He's on his way to spiritual sight. Let's stay with the story. But he's answering this. These men are perplexed. These men are confused. These men don't know how to deal with it. They don't know what to do. But he says, I know this. I know this. I was blind, and now I see. Then said they to him again, what did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? They want him to tell the story all over again. All right, and he answered them, I've told you already, and you did not hear. Wherefore would you hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? And you say, listen, my story isn't going to change. I told you the story the first time. It hasn't changed. It's the same story. Why are you so interested? Are you going to follow him? Listen, this guy's already an evangelist. He's trying to be a soul winner before he even knows everything himself. He, he, He knows one thing. He used to be blind, but now he can see. That's a good thing, and he's happy to share it. They reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. So they demanded a recount of the story, and then they debated with the man. Now, here's here's the sad thing about it. When you debate with somebody and lose, what should you do? What would be the honest thing to do? When you debate with somebody and lose... Wouldn't it be the honest thing to say, well, my, my, you're right, and I was wrong. You told the truth, and I told a lie. You had the right view of it, and I had the wrong view of it. How often does that happen in debates? Hardly ever. But notice, they're arguing with him. They can't stand what happened. So they reviled him. They are his disciple. We're Moses' disciples. We know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not whence he is. Now, this is beautiful. Okay. They're talking with the man, and notice what he did. The man answered and said unto them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing, that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened my eyes. Now, let's understand a little bit about what's going on here. With all of these things that were happening, he gave his personal testimony. His personal testimony. He gave it once, and he told it again, and then he stood by it, and he said, he opened my eyes. And he had a powerful proof. Verse 25, he said, I was blind, and now I see. He made a pointed observation. Here is this pointed observation in verse 30. Herein is a marvelous thing that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened my eyes. I thought about some other ways that people might say something like that today. Uh, This pointed observation uh, that he made, uh, that you think about, he would say something kind of like this. Well, what do you know? That's the kind of a way I would say it. What do you know? Or, well, isn't that something? He opened my eyes, and you don't know anything about it. Or he might say, if he was more intellectual, how ironic. That would be a good way to describe what's going on. You are the experts. You're the religious people that we all look to for wisdom. And you don't have a clue. Here is a man who did something decidedly miraculous. And you don't know how to deal with it. Here is a man who obviously is working with the power of God. And you people don't even know where he's from. It's a marvelous thing. And so he was now on the side of Jesus decidedly against him. Herein is a marvelous thing that you know not whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now, listen to the logic. Listen to the purity of logic that he has. He he makes this plausible conclusion, okay? And he says this, now we know, we know. Now, now he's talking about we who know God, we who understand the scriptures, we who have uh, been Jews, and, and we've been to Sunday school, and we've been to synagogue, and we know this stuff. 
Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Now what he's saying here is God doesn't work through people who are sinners. He doesn't work through people who are not following him. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? Now he read his history, or somebody had read it to him. He's blind. He, he listened. Maybe he had books on tape back then. But they, they, they read him books, and he understood history. He understood the scriptures. And he understood this. Nobody born blind has ever seen. Nobody born blind has ever been given their sight. He knew this. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. And of course, he meant anything supernatural like this. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. You can't beg here anymore. Well, I don't think he missed that old job, do you? I think he was looking for better employment now that he could see. They kicked him out of the synagogue, though. And so that tells you something. Cancel culture is nothing new, is it? It goes way back through history. When you don't agree with someone, when you don't like their views, when you don't agree with their ideology, just kick them out. Kick them out. It doesn't matter if you're looking for the truth or not. It doesn't matter if he has a point or not. It doesn't matter that maybe you ought to listen and, and, and learn. Here he knew something they didn't know. And rather than admit it and seek true information, they just kicked him out. So he made this plausible conclusion that he must be of God. And he noticed what happened. Then there comes a profession of faith. So they cast him out. Now, what does that mean? Well, they went through this ritual, perhaps, and said, you are no longer welcome in the synagogue. You were excommunicated. You were out. And so then he was out. And so he, he imagined was feeling kind of bad about that. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? Now, Jesus is, is asking him a question that you might start with if you're evangelizing somebody. He's already given this man his sight, but now he's talking to them as someone trying to win him over to faith. Okay, he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? Now, this tells you the insufficiency of his present theology. He did not know yet that this Jesus was the Son of God. He's looking for him. He said, where is he? Where is he? Where is the Son of God? If he's here, I'll believe on him. Oh, and Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. Now that's the same as saying, you're looking at him. Here I am, the Son of God. Now what did he do? And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Now you know what that means in their culture? It means that he said, Lord, now let's understand what that means. That means God, Lord, Master, Ruler, Owner of all, Lord, and he worshiped him, which means he got down on his knees. He may have even bowed down all the way. He worshiped him. He got down before him in worship to the holy God. That's what this man did. And so the profession of faith that he had is, number one, he called him Lord, and number two, he worshiped him. And I submit to you that this man is an example of a changed heart. When you get saved, you call Jesus Lord, and you worship him. When you come to light in Christ, you call him Lord, and you worship him. That is the life of a changed person. This is what happens when you become born again. What he did is the same for all who have been born again. And then we come to this wonderful pronouncement. He says this, uh, he worshiped him, and notice in verse 39. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and they that which see might be made blind. Okay, now you're speaking in a mystery. Now you're saying something profound that deserves a little thought. What does this mean? Well, he is using physical sight as an illustration for spiritual sight. Hence the name of this message, believing is seeing. You see, spiritual sight, we want to say this, you give me some evidence and I'll believe. If I see it, 
I'll believe it. That's kind of like Thomas, right? If I see the nail prints in his hands and I seal and I can put my hand in the, the wound in his side, then I'll believe. That's how he was thinking. Seeing is believing. So Jesus appeared to him and he said, Thomas, reach forth your finger, put forth your hand. He didn't have to do that. He just saw him. It was enough, my Lord and my God. And he bowed down and worshiped him. And he said, you believe because you see. More blessed are those who see not and yet believe. So we say, if I can see, I'll believe. God says, believe and you'll see. We say, if I see, I'll believe. God says, if you believe, you'll see. We say, if I see, I'll believe. God says, if you believe, you'll see. And we go on like that until we finally agree with God. And we say, okay, Lord, I believe. And then we see. We see. The things we couldn't see before, we see now. The things we didn't know before, we know now. The things we didn't feel before, we feel now. Faith becomes its own reality. And faith brings us substance. Faith brings us evidence. It's like the Russian cosmonaut that went out in outer space and he said, I don't see God anywhere. But a believer went out there and he said, I see God everywhere. You see, when you understand that reality itself is evidence that there is a God. That is, means that believing is seeing. And so the pronouncement that Jesus made upon him, Jesus said, for judgment I am coming to this world that they which see not uh, might uh, see, and they which see uh, might be made blind. Now notice what the Pharisees said. Notice them. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said, are we blind also? Now, this metaphor for truth, okay, is this. Acknowledged ignorance is a virtue that welcomes God's light. Acknowledged ignorance is a virtue that welcomes God's light. Meaning this, when you admit that you don't know something, now you're ready to learn. What if someone went to college and they showed up the first day on matriculation, they paid their money and they got in, and they walked into class, and they said, I am here because I already know all this stuff. They'd say, well, why are you here? This is where you learn that stuff. This is where you get your education. If you go in there and say, I already know it all, they'd say, well, okay, you don't need to be here. You see, but you see, none of us know all that stuff. Every day is a school day. We're always learning something else, something more, something new, something fresh. But first, you have to admit you don't know it. I think sometimes the smartest that you can possibly be is, is to be aware of how much you really don't know. And to be aware of all the things that you're not aware of. Uh, some people think they're smart because they're, they're just basically clueless. They don't have any idea of all the things they don't know. If they would get smarter, they would know how ignorant they really are. Now, this man was wise, and these wise men weren't wise. This man could see, and these so-called seeing men who had all this light, they couldn't see. Jesus is saying, I've come to make those who see, see not. And they said, are we blind also? Now, they're, they're, they're goading him. They're saying, are you trying to say we're blind? Oh, and Jesus gave them a good answer, something to think about. Jesus said unto them, if ye were blind, ye should have no sin. Now he's looking at them and he's saying, if you were blind, you would have no sin. Implying they do have sin. All right. He says, if you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remaineth. Now what is Jesus saying to them? He's saying, you've got a problem. You've got a problem. You have deceived yourself into thinking you see when you don't. You believe you are wise when you are so foolish. You believe you are enlightened when you are bound in darkness. Jesus is letting them know what their problem is, and they are self-deceived in their prejudice and darkness from Satan himself. Therefore, their sin remains. If you were to confess your blindness, he's talking about spiritual blindness now. He's making the jump from physical sight to spiritual sight. If you would admit that you're blind, that you don't know, you would be on your way to recovery. 
You remember when the religious leader Nicodemus, he came to Jesus and he said, we know that you're a man of God because no man could do these miracles except God be with him. Now think about what he's saying. He has a kindred mind and a kindred heart with this blind man who was given his sight. Nicodemus came to Jesus and said, we know who you are. You must be of God because of these miracles you're doing. And Jesus went right to him. Okay, now this man was admitting he was blind because he's coming to Jesus for wisdom. He said, unless you're born again, you shall in no wise see the kingdom of God. And he said, how can a man be born when he's blind? He's again admitting his ignorance. He doesn't know. Jesus said, that which is flesh is flesh. I'm talking about the spirit. You've got to be spiritually born again. Listen, what Jesus was doing with this whole thing was to make it so that those who admit they don't know could know. Those who admit that they don't have it, to have it. Those who admit that they need saving, to get saving. Jesus said, I come to call sinners. I come to save them which are lost. So that means, okay, if you want to have something to do with Jesus, how do you come to him? Listen, if Jesus said, I come for the lost, then what do you have to be? Lost. You have to come to him lost. Don't come to him saved unless you've already been saved. (laughs) Then you come to him saved. But when you first meet Christ, when you first hear the gospel as a lost person, you must confess your lost condition. I need something I don't have. I need to believe when I don't. I need to have God in my heart when I don't. So acknowledged ignorance is a virtue that welcomes God's light. Prejudice professed as knowledge. Prejudice professed as knowledge brings willful darkness and God's judgment. You know, we do better when we just confess our sins to God instead of trying to pretend we haven't. You ever think about the Catholic system? You go into a booth, you close the door, there's this fellow over here napping. He wakes up when you get in and you say, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. How long has it been since your last confession? And you tell him, and he goes in, and he listens to what you have to say, and okay, and that'll be so many Hail Marys or whatever they do. And, and that's the system. He says, you're absolved. No. You see, he's got his own sins to deal with. He's got his own future with God he's going to have to deal with. You, confessing your sins to some man is going to save your soul, but, but because he's got his own problems. But listen, when you go to the confession booth with Christ, here's the thing. He really has heard it all. And he really can help. He's not surprised by what you've said. He's not going to give you some little formula. He's not going to give you some little penance to make you feel better. He's going to dig down deep into your heart and soul, and he's going to do some work. He's going to rearrange. He's going to change. He's going to heal. He's going to, he's going to do what it takes to make you right. If he has to probe deep enough to where it hurts first before it feels better, that's what God's going to do for us. Listen, what if this man, think about it. Jesus put clay on his eyes, and he said, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. What if he said, well, that's crazy. That's nuts. And he just took a rag, and he just rubbed it off of his face, or maybe he found some other source of water, and he he did that, and he didn't listen. He didn't follow. Would he have been healed? Maybe not. See, he was open. He was open. Now, this is a lesson today. Jesus is still teaching this today through this story that the upper class most of the time don't have a clue what they're talking about. But God may take some ordinary, humble person and give him the wisdom that comes directly from God if they would only listen to him. You know what I believe? I believe our country would do better if they would just hand pick the average churchgoer at random, just pick them. Just say, okay, every third one, you come, go to Congress. You're a congressman now. <laughs> and maybe just draw straws among the men of a church. Maybe some plumber. Okay, you're president now. I think we'd have better than what we have right now, don't you? I think we'd have a stronger country, a more sensible country, a country that exercises more common sense. We're on the verge of voting. It's it's an election time. But what we have come to is the experts, the people who are supposed to know everything, 
and this goes with religious experts as well, are bound in darkness and prejudice and things that aren't from God. And the simple ones, the ones who just listen to Jesus, the ones who just listen to God, the ones who just read the Bible and say, I believe what this says, the ones who say God has a better idea about how to run the world than man does, those people are being pushed down and pushed out and not listened to. Now, what is this whole thing about? It's about spiritual sight. There are some things that we cannot see properly until and unless we understand it through the lens that God gives us, the worldview that He gives us through the Scripture and through His Spirit so that we see it as it is. And that is what Jesus did for this blind man. And He uh, saved him and He healed him and He witnessed to those others and said, Your sin remaineth. Now this is the sad thing. Most of these Pharisees went on to be Christ rejectors. Most of these Pharisees, some did not, but most of these Pharisees came together with the other groups and were factors in crucifying Jesus Christ. They killed him. They put him away. Why? Because they thought they could see, but they were blind. Now, there are people right now today who hold to ideologies who hold to philosophies, who hold to a certain lifestyle of living, and they're as blind as blind can be, and Christ wants to give them light. And if you have never come to Jesus and said, Jesus, please enlighten me. Please open my spiritual eyes. I accept you as Savior. Give me the light of wisdom that only you have. Because here's the thing. The Bible says if you ask for wisdom, He's faithful and just to give it. And he won't make fun of you. He'll take you whatever degree of ignorance you're at. Because to us, I mean to God, all of us are ignorant as we can be. God gives us wisdom from his storehouse. And he is free and able and willing to do it. Dear Father, I pray that we would understand the concept of believing is seeing. That we would come to you in faith and allow you to open our eyes. So that we would see things as they are supposed to be seen. Lord, that we would act as we're supposed to act. Lord, we're living in a world of darkness and it's getting darker. Oh, I pray that the light of truth will shine brightly into our culture, into our country. Lord, into our people and especially the youth of our country. Lord, that they would see that the things of God are important and are better than anything else out there. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone under the sound of my voice who has not not yet come to Jesus, that they would do so, come to him for salvation. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.